Okay, so my name is Jesus Labarta. We'll try to give a perception, an overall perception of uh, the programming of, of the device, which happens to be, so it's just in a way of, another way of painting it, an extremely heterogeneous and hierarchical system, right? And so we'll have many arms here, and then we'll have here, I have painted one, but there will be several of them, as uh, Mauro said, and there will be several of these NTX things. And if you look at this like of a tower, yes, of, I didn't paint it, but it's kind of a first outer level, a next level, and a next level. And, uh, well, the idea is which are the ways how we address programming this thing. This is nothing more than a result of a typical situation and actually I'm going to show you, kind of give you a little bit an overall perception of what has been happening and what is happening in the in the world, which is uh, life was very easy at some point in time, but uh, with all these multicores and all these things, what came out is that it is, this started to leak. Everybody, we had to know a lot about the internals in order to try and, and program well. And if you look at our previous design to program that, you have to know a lot about the internals. And the result is that yeah, these things grow and grow and you fill up of if devs and it's kind of a nightmare. And in this situation, there's a little bit of a question what, what happens to a, to a programmer? What, what do we program, what do programmers need, okay? And there's a very simple answer that is they need hope, Disney. They need a kind of way of telling them there is, this is going to be bearable and there's going to be reasonably uh, acceptable by providing some type of, of overall vision of how these systems are programmed, which need not be, and I'm trying to make it, uh, I mean, I, and, and, and we in BSC were in a computer architecture department, okay? And what I'm trying to say is forget about the hardware, forget about the architecture, it's irrelevant. There will be, if, if we are good or if they are good, they will do a very good chip. If not, in any case, we have to be able to make applications be runnable, and they have to be runnable on the EPI, but they have to be runnable everywhere. We have to be able to move them from everywhere to the EPI and vice versa. So this is the kind of approach that we have been pushing in the past for. It's kind of recovering the, the leaked interface that we had here, recovering some level of cleaner interface. We, this is uh, up here, leveraging the technologies and the techniques that people have been doing in hardware, leveraging those in software. And this is kind of the source or the origin of the work that we did in, we have been doing for a lot of time in, um, in, in OMS itself as a way of uh, actually seen as a forerunner for OpenMP. We have been doing that as a research project and this continues as a research project, but I mean, many of these proposals and ideas based on a task-based way of programming have been taken and have been influencing OpenMP and actually we keep having this for for op open for OMS exploration inside BSC, but uh, even on the EPI project itself, we are going to go to to OpenMP. So to OpenMP, we'll be implementing OpenMP on LLVM. This was our own infrastructure before. This is going to be we're going to do it on on LLVM. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, we believe that this kind of provides an, an, an important interface for such kind of uh, decoupling between the application and the, the internal subsystem. And, uh, well, the, the, the comment here was there, as this Mauro has mentioned some of these philosophical things, I was trying to focus more on the AP example itself than, than on the high-level cluster, on the single node kind of thing, more than on the, on the high-level cluster stuff. But just to mention two things which I think are very important at the cluster level is on the interaction between MPI and OpenMP. And this is a problem not for AP, this is a problem for everybody. The interaction between them is, as of today on the standard, is a little bit, uh, uh, there are issues there and we are working on things that we try to, we'll try to leverage about support for taskifying, uh, taskifying coding, also the, the communication MPI calls. 
and this is compatible with OMS and it's compatible with OpenMP and I think this is the a thing that will be very important at the high level and there's another thing which will be very important at the high, le at the high level which is malleability actually being able to shrink and, and increase and, and reduce dynamically the number of threads that the program is using dynamically. This in OpenMP is a little bit more tricky, less flexible than in OMS, but this is the kind of things that have to be, I think, have to be done and used. But I'm not really going to work, talk about that. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the programming in EPI would be, uh, but certainly just stating that I, th I and this is a little bit, uh, sometimes many of these things, you will excuse me, are personal opinions and there's a lot of people in the project, but, but I think we have to push in this direction. There's uh, MPI plus OpenMP as the high level, at the cluster level type of uh, programming model. It has to be like that. Uh, I think, well, there, there's an issue which is Sometimes it's not so much about the programming, the, the, the language or the programming model itself or the runtime that you have at hand. It's a lot about the mindset, about the mentality of the programmer. And sometimes trying to say, oh, I'm a macho programmer, I'm able to do something very well for a given thing. In, in my belief, I think it's not the most, the most productive type of solution. So we have this MPI plus OpenMP, but we are trying to push and to show people, and this is a little bit the, what Mauro was saying, trying to change how the future goes, is trying to change the mentality of the people towards a throughput-oriented approach, a throughput-oriented mentality of instantiating a lot of work, mostly on task-based approaches, trying to instantiate a lot of work and trying to let the runtime decide what to run where and when. And I understand that for a lot of people that's they are scared of that, they, are, they have fear of losing control. What I'm um, saying always is, we may, you may not think that, but you have already lost control, okay? We really don't control what the machines do. So let them do it themselves. Let, let just be able to specify a lot, of, a lot of work. And these are the two other things that I mentioned before. And of course, there's a lot of opportunities for, for the runtimes to handle to handle localities, to handle uh, critical paths, to, to, to have different versions of, 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 of runtimes to, to improve uh, performance. So there, all these kind of things I think we have, we will be trying to explore probably some of those not in the very, in the very initial thing. The very initial problem that we have is just to have the system to make it run. But uh, just to say that MPI plus MPI at the cluster at the node at the cl intercluster level, OpenMP within the cluster within the node, are the kind of external programming model characteristics. Of course, because we have this heterogeneity, we'll be having to offload. We'll have we'll have to offload from initially from here to here, and we may even have to offload from here to here. Okay, so offloading is is an important thing that will be that will be treating, we'll try to, I think, that the OpenMP mechanism provides a fair enough mechanism for, for supporting that in ways that, where you can do many different executions, orders or executions uh, of, of your program's configuration of those executions with very little change in the source code. And I think this is very important in the line or the direction of what I was mentioning, trying to homogenize heterogeneity, try to if for any a different type of architecture, a different type of configuration, you start having to use, I don't know, you try, oh no, I'm using uh, OpenCL and I now have to move this from here to, you start, just very small changes in the architecture give, leave you to, to very big changes very often in, in the source code. And this is something we have to try and, and avoid, although it's true that leveraging at a given level, leveraging the, the specificities of a system is, is of an heterogeneous system is, is something that that we that, that is potentially very interesting, but we have to handle it with care and make it available to the programmer with kind of a little bit of care. So this this thing of offloading is one of the things. So we have the general the idea is to have a general purpose mechanism for OpenMP based on OpenMP, and and there may be opportunities or possibilities or situations. Is a little bit what has been mentioned about the programming of the STX. NTX, which is very specialized kind of, kind of thing. So there may be opportunities through libraries, 
to really access those those specialized functionalities. And and the other thing that I believe will be it's important an important bet in the direction is to support to go towards vectors towards vector programming at the finer grain of the of the hierarchical kind of algorithmic structure. And, and here we, one can leverage vector automatic vectorization with all its limitations. And, but for some cases, for many cases, or for low inner levels of the syntactic tree is, is fine, is good. And then uh, the other thing is OpenMP again. Leveraging the SIMD clause is something which can be done, which actually in, in can be SIMD, can be for a small SIMD or for a large SIMD. So this is a little, these are a little bit the kind of uh, hierarchical models, MPI plus OpenMP, offloading and, and vectors. These are some of the basic, uh, basic components, okay? And vectors is what has been said in the ISA vectors give you the opportunity, philosophically, is a few words, a lot of work, okay? Instant, less, less words, more rock, like more, 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 more work with few words. They let you the possibility of decoupling the front end of the, of the, of the processor from the back end. So we believe it's, it's an, important, uh, an important aspect. There was another discussion and consideration, and we have this, this different, one of them is RISFI, the vector extension ISA, where actually all of these things are handled by the ISA itself. And then we have the specific accelerators that we mentioned, which are uh, a little bit special. So I had a, a, a little bit of this just discussion about the vectors, very, very little. And then what I had is just a small example of an XP, just showing how this can be done on, under different, different configurations. This is my idea, so I think I should be able to do it relatively fast. Uh, so this is what we have seen before, the very heterogeneous hierarchical type of system. And, but, and we have arms, and we have risks here, and we have risk. Internally to the NTX, there's as Maro was expressing, there's a small risk here also. So uh, there are two different hierarchic, two different systems. At least, nevertheless, there's some, I think there's some, some commonality. Okay, in the sense that men, philosophically, RMSB and RISC go towards vectors and towards large vectors. Probably ARM is a little bit not so large, and risk, the, what we are looking at at the risk level is for larger vectors, but it's kind of both of them going a little bit into, into that direction. Going in, I mean, there's a long, a lot of discussion about SIMD vectors, what is the difference between these things. Uh, it's not a matter of entering a, more of uh, the controversy if you want to look at it. But uh, from my point of view, certainly it's clear that the vectors, the longer the vectors, the, the less instructions you have to execute. Of course, certainly you have to be, have your algorithm has to be vectorizable, but I, I can, I mean, I would say that many of the HPC algorithms are a very, very large number of those things are, are vectorizable, a lot of the, the deep learning are. So I think should be a lot of potential there. Uh, and, you know, in, it's kind of a, 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 an invariant in history. The, if you have with the, the different processors that people have been doing, if you have to make a, a model of the IPC of, of a processor, what is the simplest, best model that takes less effort to do and, uh, and is accurate within maybe 10, 15, 25, 20% for 99% of the cases? What is the model for that? The model is IPC equal one. That's, that holds for every machine for 90% of the, of, of the real codes, okay? What I'm trying to say is that reducing the number of instructions is very, very important. And this is one of the things that vectors do. It's little, wor little words, few words, a lot of, lot of work. There's another thing with vectors about unseemed disease, whether they're fixed or variable lengths, and, and the impact this has into having to generate prologs or epilogs or these kind of things of the loops, which increases the static instruction count. And again, this is an area where where RISC-5 and, and, uh, and, uh, and ARM is not there. 
where risk five and arms share some commonality in the sense of being kind of agnostic of or avoiding those epilogues by actually and, and so I'm not going to go through the characteristics of the arm SV or through the characteristics of the risk SV uh, uh, ISA some of these characteristics but but it's kind of both of them I think share this thing that you really share with the with a micro architectural you let the micro architectural implementation to decide on what is the actual uh, length the actual amount of work that you are going to do let me go so this is just taking the example and and, and look at it how it looks like in 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 arm risk or, or even open MP. so this this is the things that we have kind of as a starting so you have the xp code which is just simply you take a vector and you add it you multiply by something and you add it to the to the to another vector so this is extremely simple code i mean some people say that just by looking at this and the implementations you can this is really very a very important model also of the performance on, on many of the hpc machines what i had here was just so this code on the arm uh, on an arm architecture scalar architecture is is translated into that by the compiler my point the, f the point that i was making is that uh, and is one of the points that what arm as uh, says with this uh, vector language not agnostic type of code is that if you do it with the arm vector thing is is like that which is about very much about the same size of code. There's no need of prologues and, or, or no need of epilogues, no, no special things. And of course, ARM is a very, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the way of achieving this vector line is by, by having, again, regions, places, is by having places where actually the micro architecture decides what is your real vector length, okay? ARM is a, is a predication centric type of machine, the RMSV is a predication centric type of machine. So essentially there are instructions that determine predicates based on the on the length of the iteration space. Okay. They generate the predicates and those predicates are then used on the actual instructions that operate on the on the loop. But philosophically from this point of view is the micro architecture, whether you do it with 256, 512 or up to 2,000 bits of, of width, the, the same source code would run on any of those machines, essentially because also the worker has been programmed such that essentially these kind of instructions tell you what is going to be the actual width of the actual operation of the, of the, of the loop of the body, of the next of the loop body. Probably here what you have is essentially typically in the, in the army implementations you have the vector length that is defined, decided by the microarchitecture and that is returned by these instructions essentially is the, is the same number as the, the functional units that you have or the width of your functional units and essentially you have like a normal superscalar processor. The only thing is that it executes a number of instructions at the same time which is actually decided by the, by the microarchitecture. But and, and, and from this point of view, again, is something which is very similar again to the risk phase. So there are no real dif differences. There, there are many commonalities. This is the only thing that I'm trying to say. And, and it has been mentioned we have the arm because it's an established starting point. And, and the risk five is, is, is a free open type of thing and gives you possibility to do other things. But it's also not that different. It's essentially the same thing. You have instructions that where you ask the microarchitecture, what is my vector length? And, and you operate with this vector length for the, for, the rest, for the rest of the loop. So essentially, I mean, essentially, the program, the program would work, the same program would work if the microarchitecture gives you every time a random vector length, right? Every iteration. That, that's the kind of philosophy in both of them. So this is what the, the processors are and some characteristics which I believe are important. And, and also, it's, it's important. So it's, this will be generated by the compiler. But essentially, also for the people, is for, for for the mentality of programming of the people is being ready or being thinking of programming with these things. Of of I I ask the system to tell me how long, and the system will decide. And just have to make my code be able to to proceed with all the whatever the system tells me. Uh, 
there's another thing, so this is kind of the, the current situation with arms and risks. There's another thing about the current situation with, with, uh, with OpenMP, which I think is because we have to do offloading, and you, OpenMP has the offloading model, and this is, uh, for AXP, would be something like this, okay? Which again has, uh, it has a couple of things that, that from, uh, and this is a personal view again, from my perception, from my, po my personal point of view, this has to do with this accelerator specific, is this about, about resource scheduling and model and, and, and execution model inside the accelerator. For my taste, is very, very, very much GPU-ish, is very much deriving from the GPU world. And, uh, and it's one of the things that personally I believe, so, and, and I said we are committed, we, have commi we are committed to support the OpenMP model. But from my, uh, from my perception, from my point of view, it would be nice to kind of liberate us from, uh, essentially, I mean, th this is the, the complexity of, of implementing a system is proportional to the number of lanes of, of pages in the manual. And the number of pages in the manual is proportional to the number of new keywords that you introduce, okay? So uh, trying to to reduce the amount of new and different concepts that we use is, is something that would be good. So this is, I'm trying to say we are going to stick to OpenMP, but we, I think we should, we will try and we should try to make people use a, a minimal subset of features of OpenMP that um, we believe are not su sufficient and appropriate and, and, ob and better from the point of view of, of specifying what you want to compute rather than how you want to compute, okay? So this is a little bit the, the situation and then just let me go about examples of how this uh, API, the system would, would be able to, or how I envisage uh, the AXP would be running on the API. Many of these things, as, as I've said, they're just, it's just how we envisage what, how we will do it. We don't yet have it working. We have some of these things working and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Or, um, so this is what would be an XP and this is how you would run either on the ARM world, you can run sequentially in XP and the code will be like that, or you can run it on the RISC-5 core side. So the RISC-5 will be accessing the L2 and through the L2 would be accessing the memory, but it's, this is just as, as a single single thread execution on any of those on any of those devices. If you can if you can start the process running this source code here or you can start the process running this source code there, it would run a sequential version of of the XP. What is this? This is just essentially using the SIMD clause and essentially should be able to generate vector code for this loop. Again, running either here, if you use the compiler targeting the ARM, and this would be done by, by the ARM compiler, or this would be done by LLVM. So it should be, should be able to generate vectorize, and depends on how good or how bad your compiler is. And I said we're using LLVM, and you will see how, how depending on that, it will be able to generate better or worse code. And, uh, and here we're using so for the for the ARM you have that there essentially the ARM is there and the ARM compiler and and for the RISC V same thing if you compile it through the LLVM infrastructure and it generates code that runs on the on the sequential on the single thread this is a standard uh, paraliz auto, uh, paralyzation of course depending on how good the compiler is it will be able to do the same code for this as well as for that essentially should be able to detect that this is a parallel loop and should be able to parallelize it automatically. May, the, part of the automatic may not work on, on more com on complex cases, but and so the hints in OpenMP kind of help you, help the compiler doing, doing that or taking decisions. This is an, an example for using only this thing. So it's, it's as, as you start with all the machines and everybody has intrinsics, so we, are, we have intrinsics for the RISC five for the vector operations. Essentially, this is what we have done, and this is what we have today. What we have today is the compiler generates supports intrinsics, which map 
not necessarily one-to-one -to, -one to the instructions in the ISA, but relatively close to one-to-one. -to -one. So you are able to, and, and the code is the same thing. You have to load this thing, you have to multiply by this thing and, and add it to this other, load this other thing and add it to the service. So essentially you have, you have to load one, load, uh, sorry, load one, load the other, multiply and accumulate and store. So it's, it's a direct thing. Is this what a pro normal programmer on a real normal application will do? Probably no, okay? But for the moment, is the way that we have to try and test and try to, maybe you might do this, want to do this to optimize some very specific kernels. You might want to. The typical thing is that the, the, is what we saw before, the compiler should be able to go from here to here, okay? And essentially, so this is what we have. The, we have the intrinsics, we have the compi LLVM that compiles the intrinsics and generates uh, as a binary code for that, which runs, uh, I'll, I'll mention about that afterwards. And as you see, we have this, uh, where you ask the system how many resources I, I want, I would like to have a vector of, of this big, okay? And then the system tells you, sorry, you have it this big, okay? So you keep, you keep, you keep it iterating. There are some, some of these variables, for example, that is uh, uh, invariant on the loop, so you can put it outside. So this is the, the, the standard thing that you could do. Is uh, the optimal situation for a programmer? No, it's, it's something that lets us kind of proceed and evolve and do, actually do the code design studies based on, 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 on something which is real codes and you can run real codes. This is standard C combines with, combines with any standard other C structure. Offloading, what we'll be doing? What if you are start running here? You start running this program, you put the, the target of load clause of OpenMP and you will be offloading that program to that program to the to this device. Actually you will be running this thing or this thing or this version, so you are running you are running the, the previous versions of the routines that we have seen, you are running them in this in this offloaded mode. Okay? This will be this will be supported. It's not yet supported, but will be based on the on the LLVM kind of offload infrastructure that you already have available. Okay, so it's, it'll be based, it'll, I mean, it'll have to be implemented, it'll have to be ported, but we don't uh, envisage major problems to, to be able to do that. Other things that can be done, of course, you could do use tasks. You can run an OpenMP code here with several tasks, or you can run an OpenMP code here with several tasks where the inner part of the OpenMP code is the same thing that we have seen before. So it can be the, 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 the version use, using uh, SIMD, or it can be the version using intrinsics, or it can be an, a, any, other, any other version of the code. Other examples of alternatives. You have the, same, the task loop before, but instead of executing this thing, so you execute it locally here, several threads, or you execute it locally three. So let's, this is, assume that you start with that version of the code locally here, but then for each of the tasks in this task loop, you kind of, each of the iterations, you kind of offload one of the, so the, the actual execution to the, to the, to the RIS-5. So you actually you have several threads here, and each of those threads offloads to one of the threads, to one of the threads in this, in the vector. What I'm trying to say is that, and what I would like to get is that with relatively small minimal syntactical changes, and minimal syntactical changes that are not, I mean, all of this would essentially be sequentially equivalent. If you get rid of the pragmas, the program is still a working program in a sequential in a sequential execution. And that's, that's the kind of idea, and that's the kind of thing that I think is very important to make programmers survive, okay? Writing sequential, I strongly believe that writing sequential code, a clean, elegant sequential code is the first step for, write, for, for doing parallel. And we have been doing that for many years at the ISA level, and we should be able to do that for many more years. So these are just, just examples. Th there's you see this one? So let me, this one is, I was offloading, I was using the intrinsics version, so it's a sequential, just vectorized version of, 
of the XP. So every thread here was offloading to one thread there, and each of them was running vector. Okay, but really, if you use nesting and you spawn the OpenMP version that we saw before, what each of the threads here spawns something there that internally spawns several other other threads. Okay, and it's the same source code in in all these. Well, I've changed the version of OpenMP or the version of Intrinsic, so it's kind of... Uh, but but this I, I consider that is reasonable minimal changes. This is another... So uh, up to here was about f from the from the GPP to the to the um, to the risk and by the way this is nesting and of course you have nesting with a device that you have to offload but essentially the nesting approach is something that one can also run locally here or locally there so it's, it's the same type of mentality I think we have to have in terms of splitting work in a hierarchical hierarchical way I change now a little bit the context to what happens when you run here, if we use the, the NTX, what we have been showing, uh, Mauro has been showing, is that there is a small risk score here, which is able to program the 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 actual uh, machines that you have here, which is able to do their own address generation, very specific operations. Okay, so how do you program that from the programmer point of view? And this is more or less what uh, Mauro used, which was taking a core from, from the typical original use that is, is of most interest to ETH, which is the, 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 the deep learning drive of, uh, of networks. This is the kind of word that, of code that would do that for, a, for an AXP. Okay, so you are doing accessing about the vectors, prefetching them, launching the operations, and actually, so it's a specific API. A, there's an API from controlling from here, this, the rest of the the rest of the of the things and this this API essentially is not doing nothing more than writing control registers for for this for this other thing and waiting for the for those things to finish to finish and and that that's the basic that's the basic idea so if we have this and this encapsulated as libraries that we may call like that the question is how do you use this thing from 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 here so one could do from here, one could do this thing is do a pragma target doing the the calling the same driver that we had before. So it's offloading from here to here. Other versions, you could actually do the same thing. So the same code, you change the target. Well, there's there's the need with the with the device type of thing to specify on to which device, okay? But essentially the source code is the same. You, you offload from here directly to there. I mean, this is something that has been in the discussion. I'm not sure whether it will be there on the very first moment or not, but it's, it's a possibility to be considered. Other alternatives. So one can do offload from here to here and from here to here. And still, all of those is, is just uh, leveraging or, or continuing with the same type of thing of leveraging the target approach and, and the fact that you can use the same codes that you would be running uh, beforehand. So the, this uh, NTX, okay, which actually was doing the offloading from here to here, you can use the same routine, invoke from here to, offload it from here to here, and then it itself internally offloads from here to there. Oops. And you can think of, of the combinations that you may want. And because of this hierarchical kind of encapsulation of the things, uh, you can go as deep as you want or as shallow as you want. Okay, but this can, in a sense, is a relatively incremental way. And the difference between running in this way and running in any of the other ways that we have seen is a difference, yes, there, there may be, you may be, as, as you have seen, I'm, I'm changing the, the actual names of the routines, but it's really not that different. And I'm changing the name of the routines because I'm not using, I'm not using, not, not, not willing to clutter more the code, but essentially a little bit, you think of this and hierarchy and these things, this is nothing more than recursion, okay? So you could write actually a single function, which does the whole thing and sometimes executes very deep, sometimes executes, and then it's only about how you control that recursion, how deep you go, how wide you go, 
and, and, and these are the kind of mechanisms, is the same problematic, same problems as OpenMP has, okay, with the, with the nesting of, of, of tasks. So essentially this is the kind of thing for the modeling, for, for the programming of the of the of the EPAC, we cons of the EPI, sorry, we consider that that the model is, or the or the the, dire the direction is relatively, relatively or quite, uh, quite uh, productive in the sense that the 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 structure of the code is really uh, clean and elegant and not changing a lot. Very little changes in the structure of the code can give you the flexibility of running on very different, very varied type of configurations based also on what you, what you have on the, your actual architecture, where actual architectures might have, uh, one could envision even in the future, I don't know, we have not, but one could envision that actually each of these things to actually be further, more recursively expanded, okay, so. But we, we envisage that the same single source code with recursive nature structure can be adapted to that. So what do we have till now? What, so, uh, well, or what people has, and actually what do we have in terms of ARM, okay? So what we have is simulation environments as of today. So the chip of Fujitsu is coming out of the oven. There's, so essentially, uh, what is people doing in the, in, in the project is, is just playing with the, with the emulator from ARM and taking a program and running the, the program and saying, oh, if I run it with an SB of 512, it takes this number of instructions. If I run it with SB of uh, 2K bits, it takes this number of instructions. It's kind of indication of what doing the simulation, just checking that the program is valid, of course, and, and, and checking kind of the total number of instructions that are executed, how many of those are SB, how many of those are non-SB, and you can, well, compare the number of the, the total number of instructions with the static structure of the code uh, by looking at the dot s output so this is the 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 kind of first infrastructure that people is using to evaluate the, the, the efficiency of the applications on the arm side so what do we have for the risk for the risk side we have something equivalent so the, the very same type of thing so essentially we take uh, on the only thing is that our compiler is still not as of today, should be in a few months, should be with supporting the, the, the SIMD clauses and all these kind of things. As of today, it's only with intrinsics. So you start with intrinsics, you pass it through LLVM, you generate the binary, what do we do? Run it on a, this is a sci-fi board with a risk, uh, a chip with four risks in it. A scalar, sequential risk, what do we have? We have an emulation library that intercepts the traps of illegal instructions, so the compiler generates the, the vector, the vector instructions. When they, when it traps on illegal instruction, the, 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 the interrupt routine, let's say, uh, emulates the, the, the operation of the vector operation and returns. And in this way, we can execute the binary and we can see whether algorithmically is correct or not. We can compare. We can run typically the way we, we do is we run the, the reference version, which is a sequential version. We run the parallelized vectorized version with intrinsics, and we compare the results. Okay. So for development, for software development, this is seen as a SDB software development vehicle. For software development, is, is a, I think it's an interesting alternative. The other thing that we do is, of course, this simulation library generates traces of what happens. In the same way that ARM was counting the total number of instructions, in our case, we generate traces of what happens. And there are traces, we are, there are timestamped time uh, traces. Well, timestamped is there. The, of course, the, the speed of this, even if it's much, much faster than a, than a, a other software emulator type of things, by running on the on the real platform. But of course, the timing is not the real timing. So we emit, we generate traces in with the time scale of uh, a, a, a one inst vector instruction per per cycle. Let's say, okay. So that's the time reference. It's not real reference, but actually, tell, but it does tell you tell you the order the order of the operations, we can, we convert those traces to be browser, to be visualized with a visualization system that we have, which was for, I mean, it was done long time ago for, for uh, at that time for only MPI programs, then it supports MPI plus OpenMP, we support the instrumentation and visualization of many other parallel programs, but we are now using it to visualize the internals of the, of the micro architect or architectural evolution of the instructions executed by a program. 
So this is one path. The other path is going through through a, a model which actually introduced timing aspects in the in the traces. So a model that actually here we have the, the stream of addresses generated by the vector instruction. Here we have a model of a cache. And with this model of the cache, we can say which of those addresses are hits, which are misses. You count, you make an estimate how this counts, and then you generate the trace file at the end. You generate the trace file, which essentially has model timing, timing, timing models, timing aspects of what those instructions, what those instructions are. Okay. So then we we can well, this was just to say this is this is this is a sparse matrix vector code. This is another code just to show. Again, the intrinsic, how it looks like, okay, but uh, the, probably there's, there's, there's one thing. This is, this is the same, the XP one. This is the XP one that I've been using as example, okay? And, and you see the code, but by the way, if you look at the assembly code that is generated by the, by the compiler, so it's, I mean, it's not exactly one-to-one -one translation of these things. It actually intermixes scalar things. It actually reorders instructions, so it's, it's kind of, we're kind of leveraging the, the standard optimization things that the compiler that the compiler would have. It's only handling registers, long registers, vector registers, but it's, it's only registers. So it's that that's all it is. And and then with the analysis we have these kind of things that we can compute aggregated metrics of, of every type of instructions in the real trace for the whole trace or for a region, how many of those were executed, for example. You can compute uh, Vector length, for example, this is the, as per time process, this is the vector length that is the requested vector length. This is the granted vector length. It's, the scale is different because this is, I start with a very long vector, the system tells me only this. So I keep, I keep asking for less and less and then I always, in this case, I always get, uh, I always get a fixed vector length, which is the architectural vector length. But there, are, there may be algorithms where, and I'll show you some plots, for example, for a sparse matrix vector code, where this is, this is, this can change. This is very dynamic. You can compute things like, things like, for example, what's, what, what's the? It's on the other slide. This is no, no. Here, what is the register usage? And and this is in a format. I'm I'm not asking you to to know it, but you should. <laughs> This is a format that tells you how many access you have to every register, all right? As, as, as a destination register, how many access you have to every register as a sort register, how many as a second sort register. These are the scalar registers, these are the vector registers, this is the, the XP thing and it uses only three registers, you see. By the way, one of them is used very seldom. And actually, for example, you can build the timeline of what is the reuse distance. And this might be interesting for architects to see, well, how do I implement or how do I map my registers into my, my available state, okay? Uh, this is an example of a register which with the life, so this is the distance. The color represents this is very, so it, it has been, pro I'm using a, a register whose value has been producing very short time ago and has been produced very long time ago. In this case, it's a register that was only produced, initialized at the beginning, and if you remember the code, there was something that was taken as invariant put outside. And so it's, it's something which is only assigned once and is never reassigned, it, but is used many times. You can zoom into the details. You can see the actual, the actual, this is, for example, the actual instructions, the sequence of instructions. And if you look at it, by the way, for example, you see that as of today, even if it runs, we don't optimize very much. We do, we're doing the same instruction twice sometimes, okay? So there, there's input for the, essentially there's input for, not only for, for architects, which it is input, is for compiler designers that maybe they have missed some, some things and it's for application developers, right? You can see which is the actual destination registers, uh, the program counter, for example, the loop, you see the loop structure, how the program counter evolves with, with time, or the, the reuse distance. For these registers, this register has been produced the cycle, cycle immediately before, this has been produced two cycles before, this register has been produced. So this kind of information is information, so the, you can get a very global aggregates as we had at the beginning, or you can get the microscopic things, which probably is useful information for 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 microarchitectures, for microarchitects, this mi microscopic pattern. 
And uh, so my final thing is, uh, well, this is just another example with, this is a, a sparse matrix vector with a real matrix, so different non-zeros per row. So the requested vector length changes. Sometimes that vector length is below the, the architected vector length. Sometimes it's above. When it's above, the thing is truncated into iterations. When it is not, it's a single iteration of the loop is done. We see also the memory access pattern, which in this case is a linear stride access for the for the sparse. So when we talk about about uh, so it's, it's, it's a very linear sparse matrix, or you see the um, very linear access to the to the to the data, or you see the program counter in this case is so, so much concentrated, and we don't see the loop structure, but if you zoom, you see it. So the result, what is essentially. We believe that MPI plus OpenMP and putting emphasis on the task base will support the parallel the for loop, but putting emphasis on that is important. This interoperability between MPI and dynamic load balance is important. Nesting and hierarchy is very important. Long vectors are very important. Support for the specific TNTX, the acceleration devices, in, in an homogenized or relatively homogenized way. And then productivity and insight with the tools and productivity with with the open with the specific or, or, or kind of mentality of using the open MPTAS with approaches are, are very important things. All of this is ongoing, is in the process of being developed, but I think we are kind of progressing well, and uh, we look forward to have the first, let's say the first compiler and emulation infrastructure with, with the vectorization clauses, with the SIMD clauses in a few months. Okay? So this is the discussion about the vector, the software side. I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have other questions. Yeah, there is time for questions, yes. So if you, yes. So you talked about this uh, upper layer from the programmer's perspective, basically the end users, but what about the middle? Because we're talking about hardware and you're talking about software, but in the middle it should be something, I mean, between the operating system. And you were mentioning as well from the, I mean, you, by you and not only you, Jesus, but uh, all of you guys uh, presenting, you were uh, explaining the architecture as a two level, mm, two different levels of, um, hardware itself. It's not basically a traditional architecture where we, where we can find the GPU and then the CPU or probably when it's together. So it's actually like can be more extended and so I didn't talk about operating system. In real. Exactly. So uh, th because that would be important even in the deeper layer or in the first layer. So who is going to be responsible for that? We, we, are, we are also working on the operating system, developing the operating system for that. And the basic approach is fundamentally there will, there will be the operating system on the R side, ARM side, and there will be the operating system on the RISC-5. Right? There will be the two of them, and that's why that's why uh, the one is kind of offload into the other. Also, architecturally, there is there is so both of them can access to the same physical memory, but. Uh, the coherency between the between the accelerator and the and the main GPP is an IO coherence, so it's not full real coherence. Okay, so still we need this this map to and map from that where we have to. The idea is to have sh physically be able to that both systems, both places, you map to the same address space, but of course you have to do the flashing and all these kind of things because uh, there are some aspects of the coherence that are kind of just kind of. Uh, an isotropic, right? The, there is in one direction is one behavior and the other is a different direction, is different behavior. Okay, I see. I see. Right? 